Greetings and welcome to the Hive Blockchain webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Frank Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, our new way of uh, communicating, it's a, it's a brand new world under this coronavirus. But uh, what I want to share with you is that it's interesting uh, how uh, the crypto mining space was still, uh, we were still able to grow and expand even during the lockdown of March uh, in that position. And I'm going to highlight uh, where our strategy, where we're going in the, in going to the future. But a high blockchain uh, is, to me, is a, it was a finding a solution to a problem. And, and uh, one of the big parts as a fund manager uh, is that we could not launch a, a ETF in this space, that we couldn't launch a Bitcoin or Ethereum. I tried the U.S., then I went to Canada. And what I discovered is the regulatory bodies, rightfully so, were quite concerned about hackers. And uh, the last thing they want to do is find out some stolen Bitcoin or a Bitcoin from uh, a hacker who all of a sudden showed up on an ETF list on the New York Stock Exchange or the Toronto Stock Exchange. So basically, it wasn't going to happen. I was being inspired and motivated by my son and my godson uh, in the, the, sort of the crypto space and what was going on. And, and I saw something. I saw something that was really profound, uh, that investment conferences, which I attend uh, all over the world, uh, that they do not cost what these crypto conferences were. And they were being sold out, $2,000, 2,000 people attending. Um, at one place, they were scalping tickets uh, because it was sold out. Uh, you know, it was a remarkable experience of, of witnessing uh, this sort of the digital world and, and how things like Tinder had changed everything in the world for kids dating. Uh, and all of a sudden, this crypto space, you saw so many young people rolling over their Bitcoin to new ICOs. Uh, I was estimated that $5 billion was flowing in 2017 uh, into uh, this sort of crypto space where kids could trade 24-7, and that was very important to them uh, around the world and hear new ideas and stories. And a lot of money uh, was just not going into speculative technology uh, stocks or into biotechnology or mining. Uh, anything that was high risk, uh, this new investor would prefer to go into the crypto space. And so I found that was so fast to me. And then being in the world of gold and sort of understanding Bitcoin, and there was this thought process that Bitcoin uh, it was an alternative to gold. It was better than gold, uh, which I don't agree with uh, because there's a complete different uh, storyline. And But I do think this concept of Bitcoin capped at the number of coins will ever be produced, uh, recently just went through another halving. Uh, it was the genius uh, created out of 2008-2009 crisis. That crisis, rather than having some young minds protesting on Wall Street or Portland, Maine or Seattle, um, they were sitting down, young brains were creating uh, a code, 64 bits, that was basically epic in its proportions. And and how they rewarded people for creating this, this sort of decentralized coin mechanism and trade between each other. Uh, that technology uh, wouldn't show that if, uh, if, if you had that model for all the credit default swaps that took place in 2006, 7, 8 that led to the financial demise of Bear Stearns and then uh, Lehman Brothers, had it been on the blockchain system, then they would have quickly been able to uh, figure out exactly the total risk, and the Federal Reserve could have written a check for $5 billion, and you would never have had uh, trillions of dollars being uh, wasted, because, but no one could figure out the counterparty risk, and this contagion spread uh, that caused this global meltdown, and, and I think it's just really important that during this process has been acknowledged that blockchain technology has many, many benefits. Uh, and what I you know, saw is I had all this knowledge was going nowhere, and friends of mine out of Vancouver and, and the, sort of the, the co-founder um, of Lionsgate Films and then now Th Thunderbird uh, Entertainment Group uh, had, uh, had this sort of concept uh, that this, this mining could be interesting but really didn't put his arms around it and totally, but from combining our brains and looking at it, I said, this is huge, being able to mine these coins. And the reason for that is that when you mine a coin, 
uh, let me explain to you some simple terms. You validate a transaction. And what was the genius about Bitcoin is it said that every 10 minutes, people ran to try to validate this, this encrypted code and say this transaction was, was correct and wasn't tampered with. And you got paid new Bitcoins for that. So those new Bitcoins were virgin coins. And that means they were untainted. They didn't have a AML risk to them or a know your client risk. So you all of a sudden you were involved in the the original coin. And I thought that that was brilliant for us. So we put up, uh, U.S. Global Investors and myself, put up money into the creation along with uh, my friends of Vancouver, put money to the creation of Hive to be the first blockchain crypto mining company. And, uh, and the first move was in Ethereum in Iceland. Uh, and uh, so I'll try to walk you through that sort of next visual uh, in the slides, is, is that it was to me so significant to recognize the amount of money, uh, and I would go to events in London, England on a rainy, wet night, and in the basement as all these thought leaders, uh, uh, people that are coding, uh, working on uh, different types of platforms of how Ethereum, which has basically become much more prolific than Bitcoin. And for me, Bitcoin is really like Andy Warhol art. That's what's going to, I think, is going to happen down the road. Uh, it'll be a collector's item who has a, who have an untainted coin, um, which can be proven where it's been and traded, uh, will have this incredible value. But Ethereum is a smart contract, and that smart contract is another sort of derivative of the Bitcoin world, and it facilitates a transaction much, much more quickly than every 10 minutes that Bitcoin does. Uh, and it's become the backbone for a lot of, most of the ICOs that have come out. So with that, that sort of growth and what we're seeing, uh, is that Hive sort of caught the imagination, and it was for that investor that did not want to go to one of these crypto exchanges, which always seemed to be prolific bad news, uh, or it just goes on with the, the negativity, or get hacked, that Hive became their proxy. So Hive became a proxy for those that wanted to play in this vehicle, highly speculative, early movement into the crypto blockchain world. And by buying a share in Hive, they participated in the growth of this industry and both ups and downs. And so today it basically Hive moves 92% of the time with Ethereum prices, which move uh, with Bitcoin prices the majority of the time. So uh, with that, we've had an incredible rise from 30 cents up to $6 as Bitcoin went to uh, almost $20,000, and it crashed down to $3,000 and then rebounded back here that just recently is now making um, uh, many uh, two-year highs. So, uh, sorry, one-year highs. And I think it's really fascinating for me to see uh, how it's caught it, and then we will trade these incredible volume days, uh, both up and down, and we move just with those prices. So I believe it's just not only retail investors and institutional investors, I believe a lot of quant funds use us as that vehicle to indirectly play Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, the more adventuresome and speculative would use the futures market, uh, which has had an all-time record high of open interest for Bitcoin, uh, which means it's a, another factor is probably helping drive Bitcoin prices up. Uh, but for here on this visual, uh, it's, it's understanding that our vision is to only be green energy. Our vision is to mine predominantly uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and be the only, at this stage I know, major uh, public mining company mining Ethereum. Uh, we're over 2%, pushing 3% of uh, all Ethereum being mined. Uh, I know there's, a hot, there's an Ethereum 2.0 coming out, but I think mining will still stay very relevant. I've heard about this uh, as a headwind for the past three years, but really it's been much more important in mining GPU, using GPUs, and using GPUs is very different than ASIC chips. Uh, so ho hopefully I have a few minutes here to share that with you. But we are that player, and our balance sheet uh, remains healthy. 
Um, we went through uh, some challenges with, with disclosure from the largest shareholder, uh, Genesis Mining, went through uh, a proxy, battled, and uh, we prevailed. Uh, we saw, signed a settlement, and we were happy. We got control of transparency of our cost structure, uh, and we were able to drive down those costs dramatically in uh, Sweden and in Iceland. And, uh, and then recently, we expanded our operations in Quebec, uh, so we have a footprint in another jurisdiction. Um, as you can see here, uh, even during uh, the coronavirus, uh, in this modern world, we're able to acquire a low-cost uh, bit mining financing facility, maybe facility um, scaling up the next generation equipment. But that's becoming now a real great difficulty. One of the things that of the coronavirus has been supply chains, and the supply lines everywhere were greatly impacted when all the airlines shut down. And what we witnessed when the airlines shut down, that the busiest airport in the world became Anchorage. It was only cargo flying healthcare equipment over to North America and Europe. Uh, as, as all these airlines shut down, the supply lines for even moving physical gold from New York, the city, to uh, London, England, exploded from basically a, a couple of dollars to $135 an ounce because you had to fly now planes privately to move physical gold, and that cost, rather than being in the belly of moving physical gold, uh, went from 30000 to $300,000. Uh, so we we see that this disruption now has this sort of unexpected collateral damage, and we're seeing with ASIC chips coming from Bitmain. Now there's been of a, a bit of a, a structural power struggle with Bitmain itself, but really the supply of getting equipment on a timely basis for the new 17s and 19s, uh, it's it's you know it's caused uh, great difficulty, and, and people they've not been able to make delivery. Uh, people sent them money. They delayed saying deliveries, and now they're talking about not to the first quarter of 2021, which is basically putting some companies in a force majeure position because they put money up front and they don't have their, their equipment to mine. Uh, we've not had this problem with GPUs, and so I'm very happy that uh, uh, as GPUs are so significant in mining Ethereum uh, and some of the other uh, alternative coins that uh, we've not been stumbled with this. But we had a strategy um, of, of building it out. Um, we've got some equipment, and uh, we're slowly noticing uh, you know, just the structural changes with it, uh, with uh, uh, mining in Quebec and some teething issues. But otherwise, uh, we're happy we're mining uh, 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 Bitcoin in that facility, um, but we do see that it, it's not straight up. You know, each country that you mine has its challenges. Um, there can be tax, VAT tax is a big, big issue in Europe. It uh, makes it very complex if you want to lease equipment. It makes it very complex moving equipment, uh, buying, and uh, there's a VAT tax on electri electricity, uh, trying to get it back from those governments. Um, uh, yeah, that's another big challenge. And, uh, and friends of mine tell me that in, in mining, even in Canada, not getting being able to get back their, their VAT equivalent uh, taxes has, has gone on for over a year. Um, so I, I think uh, we've tried to diversify that risk by Iceland, Sweden, and now Quebec. Uh, Quebec seems to be the best jurisdiction for reclaiming of your VAT taxes. Um, uh, Iceland is pretty straightforward, much more flexible and open, and not, not anti-crypto. Norway uh, was pro and then became negative towards it. Everyone left, and now they've gone back to trying to seduce you to come back to Norway, um, where low cost of stranded electricity. Uh, and in Sweden, uh, it seems to be an ongoing saga uh, for the crypto industry uh, of, of uh, just a negative perception about the industry. But the business itself in Bowdoin, uh, it's going exceptionally well. Um, but we try to diversify that risk and we'll move capital around to whatever is the best jurisdiction for expansion uh, because VAT taxes do play a big role on the viability of different countries, different jurisdictions. So as we said earlier that Hive uses only green energy in Canada, Iceland, and Sweden, uh, and there's lots of negative arguments on uh, on electricity being consumed, would consume all the world's uh, uh, electricity. I mean, it's just so greatly exaggerated by, I don't know what movement, the green movement or whatever, but we only use uh, uh, green energy. So at this stage, we're seeing other people in Texas using alternative energy. Uh, uh, they're using 
wind energy, they're using natural gas energy. Uh, so there's many ways, but we're happy that uh, we know that uh, many people use in the global world Kazakhstan, but it's coal, and we don't want to be touching anything of that nature as a, as a vision and as a structure of how we're doing our mining. And we want where there's low cost, as I said, electricity, low temperatures, and fast internet connections. And low cost electricity is very, very important. It allows your equipment to have a greater longevity. Uh, it allows you to do with the volatility of mining, uh, your rewards. I mean, if we just take a look at Ethereum prices from 110 up to 280, back to 125, I think, now back up close to uh, pushing 400. Uh, I mean, this is incredibly volatile, having low, inexpensive electricity, uh, all in costs, uh, under a nickel, uh, are so important in mining these, in, in these operations. So Hive is the largest and most diversified public cryptocurrency miner by a wide margin. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we have become that go-to stock uh, for investors uh, that if they want to play this space, this is where you, you look at Hive. Uh, and in the U.S., it, uh, uh, it appears to be Riot, uh, who's gone through their challenges with regulatory uh, battles, but I'm happy to see that they've gotten through and cleaned up uh, their management and done a, a stellar job and their refocus out of high cost electricity areas up to now New York State where it's less cost uh, and they've been using selling shares on a regular basis to fund their, their growth. Uh, but still, Hive is, is, is the go-to stock with a global footprint traded both in Germany, uh, U.S. over-the-counter, and in Canada. So blockchain uh, spending uh, is, is for the next five years is a 60% CAGR. Uh, and I think that that's important to recognize. And this whole debate about uh, elections in America, uh, mail-in, I think it, when they finally wake up that if, if, if voting was done with blockchain, uh, we wouldn't have any of these problems of double voting and uh, much safer transparency and accountability. And I think that uh, not this election cycle, maybe in the next four years, that to finally uh, we won't, will not get into political party playing one game against the other and creating a distraction, and they'll be using blockchain technology to their voting with. By contrast, the fiat money assets are continuing to increase. I've mentioned this many times. Uh, the Golden Cross for gold took place 18 months ago, um, and, and we're, we're just witnessing uh, the bottom in um, crypto uh, took place about 15 months ago. Uh, crypto has been much more volatile in that climb, whereas gold has been quiet and steadily and just till recently. Uh, this unprecedented cartel of finance ministers and central banks around the world by the G20 countries fighting the coronavirus have collectively agreed based on actions to accelerate the, their balance sheets in the central banks, money printing galore. And the last time this happened in 2008, we saw uh, gold go from seven to $800 range to 1900 So gold could, in the next four, three years, go to 4000 So where does that take Bitcoin? Where does that take Ethereum? I think they'll be end up trading at much higher prices. So this, the scenario uh, of uh, alternative asset class for crypto is very similar to drivers for gold. The only big difference is that gold is the fourth most liquid asset in the world. Uh, and, and it's uh, very important for investors to recognize it has that classic value that's been around for 5,000 years. And the other part is gold jewelry is 60% of gold demand. Gold jewelry. Hard to envision, but women in India wear something like six times, no, sorry, four, three times the amount of, of gold that's in Fort Knox. And so gold is so important, and you can't really wear Bitcoin or Ethereum the way you can wear gold and pass it on. So I think that uh, gold will continue to have an important cultural uh, asset class. I call that the great love trade. Now let's take a look at major events moving the price of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin peaked when they came out with the futures market. Uh, uh, there have been very senior executives from the CF, uh, from uh, c c regulatory exchanges come out and saying that it was a way for the regulators to stop Bitcoin from, from going 
too explosive at that stage. It did suppress. And there was nothing but negative news coming out of regulatory pronouncements and rightfully so cleaning up a lot of these bandits who were in the ICO market. And, uh, and we can see what took place that Facebook stopped any type of marketing advertising, Google, and Bitcoin fell and had a winter. That winter season lasts for about uh, 14 months. And, uh, and right at the bottom was when J.P. Morgan came out with their stable coin. And then all of a sudden, J.P. Morgan's anti-crypto uh, commentary stopped. And, uh, and it started on its bounce. And then Bitcoin ran to about 14,000 because Facebook announced Libra uh, and exploded. Then it quickly fell back uh, because uh, all the central banks around the world started attacking Facebook and what their vision was uh, with trying to reach out with their footprint of two billion people falling on their social network. Um, so I think it, it's important to recognize what is taking place, uh, how Bitcoin is, moves around with sentiment, uh, when Congress is meeting or the Senate's going to meet, uh, with technology stocks. It doesn't really matter that we get this inherent volatility that's taking place. But underneath the hood is that more and more banks are using blockchain, more stable coins are coming out, uh, and I think that uh, there's probably much more uh, weight on the positive news coming than the negative news as regulators also get their arms around uh, what's the best way to use uh, uh, this ecosystem to, to move money around uh, globally and also domestically. The next visual is high turnaround over the past month, as you can see. As Ethereum bounces, uh, we explode. Uh, and that's what's really important to recognize for investors that are trading with us. Our daily volatility is extremely high, uh, and, and it moves just with Ethereum. So you can see high blockchain trading volume, uh, how it surges. Uh, earlier this year, it was over 30 million in a day. Uh, last week, it was 20 million in a day. So we do have that go-to stock when it comes to this, this, this space. Um, and that is the sort of the last of the slides I have for you to walk you through Hive blockchain um, and I open it up to any questions. Okay, question. Once Hive has a strong cash balance, uh, ideally through ETF rally, what does Hive plan well, Hive has made public that uh, it's a gradual growth, and when I look at this industry, it's much better than uh, – it's more akin to uh, fracking from, in natural gas. You've got to be continuously spending money from your cash flow, uh, it is upgrading your systems, and we've made those announcements while we're upgrading in, in Sweden. Now we're really focused on Iceland. We've got finally control of Iceland in June. Uh, it's our asset. Uh, we just had due diligence there last week. Uh, what we have to do with humidity sensors, et cetera, to just improve uh, our production and then expand our footprint in Iceland. Uh, so I think that uh, it's a very you know, pragmatic way that we're looking at it. We do have some challenges on getting equipment for Bitcoin footprint in La Chute in Quebec, uh, but we're busy working on creative ways, and we've been buying odd lots of equipment that come here and there that people want to get out of the business. But uh, it's uh, it's this whole coronavirus has created disruptions I mentioned earlier. Now, are your plans to uh, list on Nasdaq? Uh, that'll be a board decision. Uh, what is the business model uh, difference between your company and Marathon Patent Group? Uh, I think the biggest part, I really don't know the details of Marathon Patent Group, but uh, we're the biggest players when it comes to Ethereum. And, and Ethereum is a much more important, uh, to me, long-term uh, crypto coin, a smart contract model. Uh, Will you take it to get listed on the full TSX? Uh, it's not significant to go on the full uh, TSX at this time. Leave the TSX. It, it, we have great liquidity, incredible liquidity between uh, Vancouver, uh, Germany, and uh, over the counter in the U.S. Uh, no one comes close to all the other companies combined in mining the, the, the volume that we have. Um, and is there hope for Norway? Yeah, you know, Norway is just an ongoing process. Uh, I do hope that uh, we can resolve some of those issues and uh, that, that 
that facility uh, can come back alive. As I said earlier, you know, the, the Norwegian government was very, had politicians jumping on the bandwagon that everything crypto was bad, uh, posed a tax, and immediately people left. Uh, and, and they have a lot of strand electricity. That's why it's really important for investors to recognize all over the world, there are pockets of old industries that have transformers, have hydroelectricity uh, that's doing nothing. And, and so it's just best to create jobs and start using this electricity for something that's productive. The other part I share with all my listeners today is that GPU chips have a different longevity. You don't have to accelerate the write-offs with ASICs. And they also have a, the opportunities down the road to do rendering for uh, AI technology and for um, film, for animation. So there's many more opportunities for these GPU chips that we feel are very exciting compared to ASIC chips, which Bitmain seems to cannibalize uh, every 18 months. I think uh, I've got all the questions answered, and uh, please uh, visit our website uh, at High Blockchain Technology and sign up so that you can get uh, regular information about us. As I said, we're a very, very liquid name, and uh, our goal is to become uh, the go-to stock for those who want to uh, play in this crypto mining space. But please remember the volatility of, of Ethereum and Bitcoin are of a magnitude five times greater than gold on a daily basis and on a 10-day trading basis. So before you go in the space, understand uh, this DNA of volatility. Thank you. And this concludes today's webcast. You may disconnect at this time. Thank you for your participation.